good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I, I'd like to thank uh, the Uppsala University. Oh, okay. For inviting me uh, to this, the Swedish oldest university, <laughs> and also the very nice time. <laughs> I like it very much. <laughs> okay, so uh, using uh, the Nobel Lecture Prize, I'd like to explain the the history of blue LEDs and their future prospects. Okay, let me explain first, what is LEDs? The, maybe you know the LED lamps, it's like that. Uh, but inside the uh, lamps, there are small chips, semiconductor chip. Th this is still large size, uh, one millimeter size chip, uh, high power LEDs. <laughs> but uh, the, the conventional LED chip is very small, only two, 0 0.3 millimeter squares. So uh, let me explain first uh, the history of artificial lighting. The, before the 19th century, fire was the only uh, method for artificial lighting. Uh, in principle, the uh, fire, uh, we use the chemical reaction, oxidation of high, uh, carbon hydride. So uh, in 1897, the new uh, artificial lighting have been uh, invented. That's the uh, incandescent lamp. The principle is the black body emission. So it's an early stage of quantum mechanics. And in 1924, this is the real quantum mechanics uh, uh, system that is fluorescent lamp. But uh, this system needs a vacuum and a small amount of uh, mercury atoms. Then uh, in 1962, the newcomer, <laughs> uh, solid state lighting system based on uh, semiconductors have been uh, commercialized. This is the uh, so-called fourth generation artificial lighting. <coughs> the principle of incandescent lamp is really the black body emission. So the efficiency is high. Efficiency is high. But in the visible region, the uh, unfortunately efficiency is low. Uh, majority of the emission well, in the infrared region. So uh, the uh, luminous efficacy of radiation is lower than 20 lumens per watt. Fluorescent lamp uh, excited the electrons uh, at, excite the mercury atoms and then uh, uh, ultraviolet light was emitted from uh, the mercury, then uh, excite the phosphorus. Uh, in this case, uh, the luminous efficacy of radiation is much, much higher than the incandescent lamp, but still, uh, which is, uh, it is limited by the Stokes shift loss. Stokes shift loss. So high energy photon excite the low energy photon. Uh, uh, high energy photons uh, transfer the energy to the low energy photons. So the efficiency is uh, automatically remitted. In comparison, in case of LEDs, this is the transition uh, inside the semiconductors and Basically, no uh, energy loss mechanism except for the due loss. So that's why LEDs are thought to be a most promising uh, method of the uh, future uh, writing source. 
Okay, let me go back to the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, the first LED is commercialized in 1962. That was the red LED based on gallium arsenide phosphide. And soon after the red LEDs, the green LEDs and the yellow LEDs have been commercialized using gallium phosphide as the uh, material. But there is no blue. Okay, uh, at that time, I would like to explain why the blue uh, emitting material was so difficult. Uh, this is the today's uh, blue LED material, that is gallium nitride. In order to prepare the large size crystals, we need a very high pressure and a high temperature, which is quite similar to the synthesis of diamond. So, in order to prepare the material, we need the chemical reaction to reduce the pressure and the temperature. Uh, for as the nitrogen source, we use the ammonia. But ammonia is very, very reactive at high temperature. So we have to use the foreign material as the substrate, but the candidate for the uh, substrate material was quite limited. Uh, sapphire is one of the most promising material because it is stable at high temperature and stable in a ammonia uh, condition. But the, the problem of the sapphire is the large lattice mismatch between gallium nitride and the sapphire, which is as large as 16%. In general, uh, for the heteroepitaxial growth, uh, the lattice mismatch should be less than 1%. So the 16% uh, lattice mismatch is almost impossible to grow the gallium nitride. Okay. In addition, in 1971, Professor Pankow's group succeeded in developing our first gallium nitride blue LED. But this type was not on today's PN junction type LED. That's the M metal insulator semiconductor type uh, LED. So efficiency is quite limited to be low. They couldn't get the P type gallium nitride. And also, uh, eye sensitivity of the human uh, in the blue region is only 3% compared with the uh, 555 uh, greenish yellow, right? So in order to realize the same brightness, we need uh, 33 times higher power for the blue. Okay. So uh, uh, in 19... The 80s, Japanese groups headed by Professor Akasaki also tried to commercialize the mistype LEDs. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the Japanese company's uh, LEDs uh, using the uh, tank of type structures. Uh, the efficiency reaches 0.1%. But very unfortunate that the company, Matsuta Insti uh, Research Institute, now Panasonic, quit the program. So the Professor Akasaki have to move from the company to Nagoya University. Then he restart 
the gallium nitride uh, research using a different method. This gallium nitride was grown by the so-called hydride vapor phase epitaxy using metal gallium, hydrogen chloride, and ammonia. Uh, he moved to Nagoya University in 1981, and I joined his group as an undergraduate student. Uh, when I found the uh, subject, the graduation research, nitride-based blue LEDs, oh, that seems very interesting, <laughs> very fascinating. I thought that at that time, the size of the TV system using brown tube was too, too bulky. So if I can realize the good device, blue LEDs, I can change the world. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, I was not aware that th this subject was so difficult to, to achieve. So uh, the students, including me and uh, Dr. Koide, uh, started the research uh, of gallium nitride using another method, that is metal organic vapor phase epitaxy. Uh, we don't use the hydrogen chloride, it's so reactive. So we use the better source material, that, that is metal organics, which is very soft and easy to handle. But uh, this is the research funding situation of the university in Japan in the mid 80s. Uh, we started here, but the research funding was so limited, the basically only three million yen. So uh, 30,000 hmm? 30, US dollars. Per year, so which is, of course, not sufficient to buy a uh, commercially available MOVP system. So we have to develop the MOCBD MOVP system by ourselves. Okay, <laughs> so uh, we developed this handmade MOVP reactor in 1984. So this is what <laughs> we I measured. <laughs> the susceptible temperature by pyrometer. And this is me, and this is the reactor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we have tried many, many times, uh, or I, I tried many, many times to uh, grow the high quality gallium nitride. Uh, for example, I changed the reactor configuration. Uh, this is, uh, I found that this was not good in terms of the uh, uh, in-situ flow uh, observation. So we change, uh, I changed uh, the configuration like this, the very high speed uh, gas flow. Then uh, I can grow the gallium nitride, but still the uh, surface morphology is quite bad. It's, it's like a milky surface. Uh, the large lattice mismatch, uh, the problem of the large, mismatch, large lattice mismatch was too great to overcome for me. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is the uh, example of the the growth mode as a function of the lattice mismatch. If it is small, we can grow atomically flat uh, surface. But if the lattice mismatch was too large, uh, island growth occurred like this, then finally uh, we can only get the small, much of strong pieces of island of gallium nitride. The size is very small. <laughs> then, uh, uh, just the end of um, master course, uh, I carried out the research alone. 
then uh, I tried to use the another material the, that is aluminum nitride just in between the sapphire and the gallium nitride because uh, my student colleagues, the Dr. Koide, grew aluminum nitride and aluminum gallium nitride. And I concentrated on the gallium nitride. But if we compare these two materials, his aluminum nitride seems to be a bit better compared with my gallium nitride. So I think uh, that aluminum nitride should be effective to improve the surface morphology. So uh, I decided to use the aluminum nitride insertion. But uh, I knew that the substrate temperature should be higher than 1200 centigrade for the hepteroepitaxial growth of aluminum nitride. <clears throat> but the oscillator system for heating the substrate was too old. It's developed in 1960s. So even though I, I controlled the uh, PID and something, I could not reach the temperature up to 200, uh, 1200 centigrade. Uh, so at that time, I remembered the hint uh, from the Dr. Sawaki. We discussed the how to grow uh, heteroepitaxial, uh, how to realize high heteroepitaxial growth. And he mentioned that the, in case of boron phosphide on silicon, the large la la lattice mismatch is as large as 24%. But he claimed that the preflow of phosphorus source gas is very effective to improve the surface morphology of brown phosphide on silicon. Then I imagined that the low temperature supply of aluminum nitride may promote the supply of nucleation center of aluminum nitride. So I decide to deposit aluminum nitride at low temperature and proceed the gallium nitride growth. And when I took the sample out from the reactor, <laughs> it, it's perfectly smooth and perfectly transparent. So my first impression was, oh, 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 oh that's that's a mistake. I uh, I forgot to supply the gallium source. <laughs> but when I checked the reactor, or uh, the all the valves uh, was operated properly. So uh, I uh, observed the surface by Nomarski type optical microscope and found that the it was atomically flat. But Oh, so I, I was astonished. But when I uh, went to the Professor Akasaki, he was so cool. Um, maybe the surface morphology was not enough. You should measure another material uh, properties like uh, crystalline quality, electrolytic pro properties, and optical properties. Then I checked all the properties, but and found that. The all the properties was superior to other every other uh, previous reports. So this technology uh, becomes worldwide, and uh, fortunately, uh, all the people use this low temperature buffer technique uh, worldwide. So uh, after the success of the growth of high quality gallium nitride, the, my next target is of course the P-type gallium nitride. Uh, from 1985 to 1988, 
five, six, seven, eight, to four years. <laughs> we used the zinc as the acceptor dopant. But even though I changed the uh, zinc concentration and the growth condition, for example, growth temperature and everything, every, uh, all the try was failed. We couldn't get the P-type gallium nitride. But uh, I found very interesting phenomena. During the cathode luminescence measurement, the blue luminescence related to zinc enhanced irreversibly. So we can light the, the character by the electron beam irradiation. So we call it uh, low energy electron beam irradiation treatment. But even though uh, the sample was uh, treated with uh, low energy electron beam irradiation, all the samples showed the highly resistive. In 1989, I was become the research associate of the Professor Akasaki's lab. Okay. Then uh, I found the, this graph in the textbook, the bonds and the bands in semiconductor written by Dr. Phillips, that the magnesium is much, much better than zinc in terms of the actuation. But uh, at that time, the magnesium metal organic source, that is this cyclopentadienyl magnesium, <laughs> was too expensive <laughs> for the research associate. So I begged the professor Kasek to let me buy some. <laughs> and he, he was so uh, kind to allow me to buy the sources. <laughs> and after waiting several months, uh, we uh, tried to start the growth of magnesium gallium nitride. OK, uh, as for the magnesium in gallium nitride, I have to mention this. <laughs> This person, <laughs> he, he is uh, Dr. Marska, at that time the Stanford University student. <laughs> he uh, developed the first world's first violet LED based on magnesium, magnesium dope gallium nitride, but it, it is the MIS type, not the PN junction type. So uh, he, he became very happy and <laughs> <laughs> he, he thought he, be, he should become a rich man. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so uh, the as ground uh, magnesium of gallium nitride shows uh, highly digestive, but after uh, raw energy electron beam irradiation treatment, it becomes uh, P, uh, P type. But soon after, <laughs> Professor Nakamura, the Nietzsche group, uh, found that uh, P-type gallium nitride was possible uh, by the very simple thermal annealing. Okay. So uh, this thermal annealing becomes popular, and all the company uses this technology today. And the mechanism is very simple. Uh, there, uh, when it was as grown, the magnesium was uh, passivated by hydrogen. So hydrogen atom uh, prohibit the P-type conduction. By Levy treatment or by thermal annealing, the hydrogen was dissolved. Then the P-type gallium nitride can be realized. There, okay, uh, we step forward, the high quality crystal P-type, and the last step was to realize the real band-to-band -band brew transition. The band gap of gallium nitride was in the ultraviolet region. So in order to realize uh, true brew emission, we need to reduce the band gap. 
So we need to input the indium in gallium nitride. So so-called indium gallium nitride is uh, necessary. Of course, we have tried to grow uh, the indium gallium nitride uh, in 1987, but it was not so successful. This material is very difficult to grow. Uh, so we only uh, add the indium content of only 3%, which is still in the UV region. We need much more indium, more than 15%, for the true blue emission, okay? Uh, in 1989, the NTT group, Dr. Matsuoka, succeeded to grow the uh, high indium content indium gallium nitride by growing at a very high amount of ammonia flow condition and uh, using the nitrogen as the carrier gas. Okay. So, to summarize, there is a long, long history of Professor Akasaki's uh, fundamental research for the nitrates. I uh, can concentrate it on the uh, high quality crystal and the P-type gallium nitride. Then, uh, Professor Matsuoka uh, succeeded the indium gallium nitride growth. And finally, Professor Nakamura team succeeded in uh, commercializing the blue LEDs. So now uh, we can use uh, at the back right of the smartphones and also even the lighting system. Okay. So uh, this curve shows the development of LEDs uh, performance. Uh, by the emergence of white LEDs, the the speed of uh, improvement is also accelerated. Uh, I'd, I'd like to show some. This is the blue LEDs, okay? <laughs> but by adding very tiny papers, it becomes white, okay? <laughs> this is the uh, white, the commercially available white LEDs, okay? <laughs> Okay, uh, how the LED changes our lives? Uh, it, it's not a good, good <laughs> trend. Many, many people are concentrated on the smartphone, so it is sometimes very dangerous. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, let me explain the more serious thing. Uh, this is the situation of nuclear power plants in Japan. The, uh, this is, the red shows the stopped or, or the operation. Uh, there are 20, uh, 48 reactors in Japan, but all the reactors were stopped now. So before the, the 2011, the, about 30% was supplied by nuclear power plants, but all the nuclear power plants stopped now. So we have to repair, or we, we have to find the, to adapt this 30% uh, electricity. So how the LEDs contribute to the energy savings? By year 2020, about 70% of the lighting will be, uh, uh, LED will be used. So we can save about 7%, about a quarter. <laughs> of the 30% can be saved by the LEDs. Okay. Okay. So the time is coming, so I'd like to explain the, some other applications. The LED lighting is also very promising for the uh, uh, food uh, or plant writing system because we can irradiate only the necessary right for the food, okay? And also, some group try to control you <laughs> by the LEDs. Uh, I mean, uh, no, not you, but uh, <laughs> this, this is an example. Some medicine people try to control the mouse by the LEDs. They cut some, your sculpture, very tiny. 
then input the small LEDs inside the brain. The, if they emit blue light, the mouse becomes very active. But if they emit orange light, mouse sleeps. <laughs> they can already control the <laughs> activity of the animals. <laughs> that, that's a very interesting story. OK, that, that's all for uh, today's uh, speech. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> <clears throat> of time for questions uh, so if anybody in the audience uh, want to ask a question feel free free feel free please free feel free to ask and uh, don't don't be afraid well let me try to break the ice yeah <laughs> uh, as you explained there was a lot of struggle to reach the to reach this uh, invention. So how much would you say was, uh, as we say, blood, sweat, and tears, and how much was inspiration in this work? How much inspiration? Inspiration uh -huh. compared to blood, sweat, and tears, so to say. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, the inspiration, inspiration, OK. The, uh, for, for, for me, the most important thing is to, to imagine the goals. The, that is the uh, blue LEDs and the very smart displays. The, that's my inspiration. So once uh, I have uh, found the inspiration of the future goal, uh, it, it is very easy <laughs> to concentrate on this uh, the goal. Okay. <laughs> There is up there. There is a question. Could you bring a microphone, please? Thank you. Switch on. Can you hear me? So oh, yes. congratulations again. Thank you. <laughs> I have two questions to you. Mm -hmm. uh, first one, would you explain the optical safety under the uh, blue light? Because I read some articles from Harvard University publication mm -hmm. in health mm -hmm. uh, saying that but the blue light might harm our eyes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and my second question is, um, uh, I think your speech talks more about development, which is very, very, very informative. Mm -hmm. um, but would you maybe summarize about the future prospects? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, okay. The, as for the first question, yeah, the, we should be careful for, yeah, the LED lighting is still a newcomer for uh, the lighting source, so we should be careful for the effect of the, especially the high intensity blue uh, light to the human, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I know that the blue lights. Uh, affect the uh, second that's, uh, rhythm of a human. Uh, it, the, the blue light, by using a blue light, the student becomes very, very active. <laughs> 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 uh, or the, it sometimes affects the, the sleep of the, uh, the people, so we should be careful for uh, the effect of the blue light, but we, we can control the spectrum very easily. So, uh, if we need a much softer uh, writing source, we can change the phosphor material. So, I think it's not so serious. Okay. And as for the uh, future uh, application of LEDs, uh, uh, as I uh, showed you 
the control of the animals <laughs> is very interesting uh, because uh, they, this can be used for the treatment of the, the people who have some trouble in the action, like, like uh, 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 hand or the legs or... Uh, by using this kind of approach, uh, we, can, we can treat the, the activity of the people. And already some medicine group try to use this idea by combining the LED technology and the molecular uh, con uh, modification technologies. They can, they can uh, control the sensitivity of um, um, proteins. Uh, for example, uh, the, some molecules is sensitive to the blue right, and some molecule is sensitive to the orange right. Then uh, it can be used to the uh, connected uh, the synapse connection. Okay, uh, sometimes uh, the syn synapse uh, was cut, and sometimes syn synapse uh, connect. Then uh, we can control the uh, motion or activity of the animal. So this approach is very interesting to me. Okay. So other questions, please. I was wondering for future development of white light sources, is it better to to have a blue LED with new phosphors, or mm -hmm. should we have um, blue LEDs combined with uh, red and green to create mm -hmm. white light? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. The, the reason why we use the blue LEDs with phosphor is we can uh, only use the one uh, electricity source. In, in case of the three primary color systems, we need a three uh, electricity source. Um, but theoretically, uh, the combination of multi multicolor LEDs is met much, much better than the uh, conventional system. The conventional system, the uh, maximum uh, luminous efficacy of radiation is limited to be 200 lumens per watt. That's, that's the limit. We, only, we already saw the limit. But by using the combination of the three primary color systems, we can reach more than 250 lumens per watt. But the problem was, as shown in this view graph, the, we have the green gap problems. That is, uh, for LED LEDs, we use the phosphorus-based material, aluminum, gallium, indium phosphide, and for Blue, we use the nitride system, indium, aluminum, indium, gallium, nitride. Please imagine the atomic table of the group 5 row, chrome 5 row. Nitrogen and phosphor arsenide. And in between the nitrogen and phosphor, there is no element. That's the origin of the green gap. So we have to find the another way of developing a highly efficient green LEDs without the element between nitrogen and phosphorus. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Hello. I, I want to go back to the first question about mm -hmm. what uh, motivated you. Did you, when you said uh, uh, you have to look for the goal, mm -hmm. did you ever imagine that uh, blue LEDs would become this revolutionary and this 
on, on this uh, on such a big scale because oh. it's, it's not just our phones are much prettier I like the screens it's uh, taking it to the third world countries and places where uh, light bulbs can't be sufficient enough and which LEDs are did you ever have that in mind when you, ha you set your goal or oh, was okay. it a bonus <laughs> Yeah, to tell the truth, uh, when uh, I was their uh, student, I only imagined that the displays. Maybe we can fabricate the very smart displays, and I, I have the image of like a cell phone or smartphone. But that's all. I could, or I could never uh, imagine that. The LEDs can be used, even the general writings. That, that's very tremendous. <laughs> I, I, it's my very big surprise uh, that the LEDs can be used, even for the LED writings. Thank you very much. Uh, LEDs are also being used as photo detectors yeah. in astronomical instruments. Were you aware of this principle as well? They work in reverse. Yeah, yeah. So you were aware, it is, are they being uh, developed for that purpose as well with different materials, or are they the same device? Yes. Uh, we have the project of the next generation, much higher efficiency solar cells based on the nitrates. <laughs> We are trying to develop uh, more than 60% efficiency uh, solar cell system using the nitrides by the March projection systems. By changing the indium composition uh, in the indium gallium nitride, uh, we can develop a stuck structure uh, of uh, solar cells. And uh, we, we have tried already. But uh, at present, the efficiency was limited to below because of the difficulty in growing the high quality, high indium content indium gallium nitride. In order to realize a 60% uh, efficiency solar cells, we need the indium content more than 50%. But at present, we succeeded only the 20% of the indium content. So the, in the solar spectrum, we can only use the very tiny amount of the high energy portion. So we need uh, higher indium to, to reduce the band gap of indium gallium nitride. Okay. So you started off talking about the history of light sources, mm -hmm. and do you think that this then is the final step in the history of light sources, or will someone make some even better light source? <laughs> <laughs> really, I hope it's a final light source. <laughs> but, uh, maybe in future, the, the, the some newcomer comes. <laughs> uh, I I hope the newcomer comes, but uh, yeah, at present I think this is the final goal. <laughs> okay, <thank you. laughs> Thank you. My name is Matt Edmondson. Yeah. I'm from um, IEEE, the chair of Sweden section. Uh, <laughs> very warm congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, also, we're very happy that there's an IEEE background here. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I would like to ask you to elaborate. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the challenges we have in this small country mm -hmm. is that have enough students thinking science mm -hmm. and engineering is mm -hmm. worthwhile going mm -hmm. into, mm -hmm. because it is a lot of quite some uh, studies yeah. in difficult areas, yeah. and it takes a long time. Yeah. I think what you just described is if you start in the 60s, you get a Nobel Prize in mm -hmm. the 2014 or 2013. Mm -hmm. Not everyone has that time perspective. But is there anything 
given your achievement, that could be good for us to think about how to make these very important areas, not mm -hmm. just in LEDs, but elsewhere, mm -hmm. more popular and to mm -hmm. make more people really going into it with mm -hmm. endurance? Mm -hmm. I know oh. this is a difficult question, but since it's you're a Nobel laureate, I'll give it to you. <laughs> oh, it's very difficult. How, how to answer that? <laughs> okay. Uh, in my case, I think the most important thing is to, to get the image of the success or get the image of the future. So once the, the young people get the, the image of the success, Maybe they can concentrate on the uh, issues and uh, continue. E even it is very difficult. N that's no problem. So <laughs> I, I think the most important thing is to, that the young generation have the image of success or image of the future. Is that okay? <laughs> For me, it's okay. Yeah, it's rather you. what will happen with the young generation. But I think, yeah. I just want to add on to that. I think that what you're doing is absolutely excellent mm -hmm. uh, because you are, I mean, you really bring this to, mm -hmm. to the public, not mm -hmm. just in, the, in science and mm -hmm. academia. Mm -hmm. And also, just comparing what we did uh, with a previous Nobel laureate, when when I was a PhD student, I would mm -hmm. have loved to meet a Nobel laureate. Oh. I would probably have been insp uh, inspiring me. So wow. I think that what you do now in this touring is absolutely excellent. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh. Uh, congratulations and uh, thank, thank you, you for your interesting talk. I was so encouraged oh, by really? your oh, interesting good. talk. <laughs> Since uh, I'm an extended student, I'm mm -hmm. studying in this Ongström lab from mm -hmm. Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a question. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. um, from now, your decision when you choose your current field, mm -hmm. it's a very, very super big decision, not only for you, but also for the human society and the oh. science history, I think. Oh. <laughs> but uh, did you have other option to go other field, or did you only think about going this now current? Ah, field? I see. Uh, when I was a student, uh, yeah. Uh, Okay. <laughs> um, the primary school and junior high school, I was not a good student. I hate to study. <laughs> I, I didn't understand what is, uh, why I should study. <laughs> but uh, at high school, I enjoyed the, I, I was interested in the mathematics. So I concentrated on the mathematics. Other subjects, no. <laughs> Only focused on the uh, mathematics. And I entered the university. And still, uh, I didn't uh, find uh, the, the, uh, my goal or my research. But not, uh, when I uh, found the, the blue light emitting diode, yeah, I, I thought, oh, that was my way. So, um, yeah, there, there, are, there may be other options also, but, but there are, I, I, I'm <laughs> uh, concentra concentrated on or uh, think very deeper which uh, way is the best way for me. So that, that, that is, I think that is the most important uh, decision for, for me. So in your case also, you, you will find, uh, you, you, you should think very deeply, which is the best decision for your goal. Thank you very much and yeah. congratulations again. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Congratulations to all of the professors. Thank you. Who has achieved this Nobel Prize. 
so basically sir you have uh, fabricated gallium nitride based led right mm mm-hmm. and what is the future scope for polymer based leds will the polymers can emit the blue light also mm-hmm. yeah, could, could you will the repeat? polymers also can emit the blue light mm mm-hmm. mm mm-hmm. i'm just asking the future scope for this uh, polymer based leds oh i, I can't catch this part no oh, problem Hey, okay, could, could you repeat once again now? Yeah, the future scope for polymer based LEDs, polymer PLE, polymer LEDs. Oh, polymer LEDs. Yes. I see, I see. Oh, the the oh, the polymer LEDs are liable. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, of course I I know that the polymer polymer or organic LEDs it, it's also very important for the the wide range uh, illumination. So the Japanese companies think that uh the wall illumination by organic leds yeah the the country like sweden <laughs> in winter there there is small sunshine <laughs> so <laughs> even in the house oh, you you can enjoy the the sunlight by the wall light illumination that's one of the uh, expected applications but but um, of course the problem would be the cost maybe uh, the company people should be very careful or should do hard work to reduce the cost of uh, organic leds uh fabrication is that okay <laughs> thanks hi So first of all congratulations Thank you. it's absolutely fantastic to be here and witness this mm-hmm. so i have a general question my question is like how does one know that okay this is my field i want to do this like you were just saying uh, okay uh, you just said you were not a good student that appealed me the most i was like that mm-hmm. i am still like that so how how do, how do you know okay when you come across this uh, blue light led or this kind of uh, research you thought okay yeah this is my field how how does one know how i decide yeah oh. how did it, <laughs> how did it click to you okay this is my field yeah, i yeah. want to do this i want oh to. it's also very difficult question <laughs> okay yeah uh, in my case I, i was interested in the the change of the uh, especially the computer system it becomes better and better on the uh, all the people ah when when i was a student uh the change of the computer system uh it very drastically so uh, i thought that uh, i want to be involved in this dramatic change and there uh, yeah uh, to tell the truth uh, i would like to be involved in the development of the cpu <laughs> okay the rsi system but unfortunately there is no laboratory at that time in uh, nagoya university the, uh, which is concentrated on the development of cpu so i found uh, the another laboratories and finally i found that the uh, blue led fabrications uh i thought that this is also contribute to the development of the future uh computer system because of the at that time the display is so big <laughs> so we can reduce uh i can reduce the uh, size and the we we can supply i can supply the smart displays based on the new computer system so uh that, that that's the reason why i can concentrate on this subject so the uh, most important thing is to find the trend okay. thank you Okay so if there are 
No further question. I would like to give the word to the chairman of the Uppsala Physical Society. So again, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation and of course congratulations. congratulations. Uh, the Physical Society here in Uppsala is a smaller society for physicists, mm -hmm. but we also nominate some um, honorary members oh. about once a year. Mm -hmm. To become a member is fairly easy, you just have to live here and work with physics, but mm -hmm. to become an honorary member is slightly more difficult. You first mm -hmm. have to be awarded the Nobel Prize, Oh. <laughs> uh, which we have evident have succeeded. And secondly, you have to come here and give a lecture, uh -huh. uh, and which you also did. So oh. <laughs> I printed out a small diploma. Wow, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> no. Thank you. And of course, the Ångström medal. In wow. <laughs> wow, very on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very Thank nice. You for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs>